You can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. I had a question from a friend of the ministry, and she wanted to know about fasting. What does the Bible say about fasting? Is fasting for a Christian today? How do you fast? How long can you eat? Can you drink? Whatever. So, and I thought to myself at the time she asked the question, I thought, well, it shouldn't be too hard. I can answer that pretty quickly. I got a study on that. Look through all my videos. Actually, I don't have a study on that. So, now I will. Uh, it's a very, very good question and actually a very important uh, topic to discuss. So let's start out here in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and, that, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Alms is, would be another way of saying when you're giving money to the Lord. Uh, I don't believe the tithe is biblical, a 10% tithe is unscriptural, but certainly you giving money to the Lord's work or whatever else, a uh, missionary or a preacher or whatever you decide to give your money to, um, those are things that, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, you're going to see there's three things in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 18. There are three things. It starts off with alms, which is giving of your money. Number two, you have prayer, which is basically it's, it's uh, you're giving your time, you know, uh, taking time to talk to the Lord about things. And number three, you have fasting, giving up food. What are all three of those things? They're sacrifices that you have to make, personally have to make, of your own free will. If I come to your house and I force you, I take all your food away and say, now you're going to fast until I bring your food back. Is that the right spirit? Nope. It's between you and God. If I uh, come and say you're going to be forced to pay a certain amount of money to even watch my videos or something like this, pay-per-view or something, you know, set up my own pay-per-view thing, is that of the Lord? No. Um, there are people that give to this ministry and praise the Lord for you. There are others that don't. That's between you and God. Uh, it really is. I've never made a charge for uh, the things I do and whatever. I mean, I used to charge for DVDs, you know. Uh, there's one of them there. You know, here's one right here. You know, the real Bible version issue exposed. I used to charge for this. Why? Because these things cost money to make. All right. So I charge money for things that, that cost me. You know, I'm, I'm making a product to sell, and I pay taxes on that and everything else. So, of course, I would charge money for that. But these videos I put out online, they are completely free. They are not copyrighted. I've never copyrighted one of my videos, including my DVDs I put out. And the Lord's always provided. Why? Because God puts it in somebody's heart to give to this ministry. They see what goes on here. They say, hey, I appreciate what Brother Brian's doing. And, you know, how his wife... You know, Catherine, Sister Catherine, she helps me out. She's not a, a pastor, as I've said in other videos. I get that thing put on me a lot. We waste a female preacher. Oh, no, she's not. You know, I preach against female preachers. Why would I do that and then have my wife be one? She's not a female pastor. Okay, she helps me in research. She gets in the videos and stuff like that to show the research that the Lord has shown her. But, you know, uh, we don't publish I, mean, I have all the lists of people that give to the ministry and stuff. I have them available. I would say I don't keep them. But uh, I don't, you know, years ago, I used to I used to send thank yous to everybody that, that donated to the ministry. And I had a couple of people kind of rebuke me for it. And they quoted these verses right here and said, Brother, it's between me and the Lord. You know, we see what you're doing. We see you put a lot of hard work into this. You're preaching things that other people don't have the guts to preach. You do it all for free and uh, really give of your time. Uh, I don't charge people for emailing or counseling or things like that. I answer a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. It's free. You know, there are people that see, you know, okay, it's, he's doing it for free, but he has bills to pay. I'm going to give him something. Okay? And I need, to, I need to restate these things occasionally just simply because I get attacked on this thing a lot. People say he doesn't work for a living. And I'm going, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know? Uh, so having a secular job is working for a living, and this is not. Um, my secular jobs I've had in the past, I get to walk away from. 
uh, this ministry, I don't walk away from it. It's all the time. So, let's continue here. We're going to see about prayer now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, and they may, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. i got to just tell a story here real quickly. Uh, I remember first Baptist church I ever went to was Cornerstone Baptist Church in, um, what was that? Uh, oh, man, I, Lidditz. I couldn't even think. <laughs> Been here in Maine for a while. Lidditz, Pennsylvania. And I remember there was this one woman and she was like a nurse or something and she had all these single daughters, you know, and they were all like super smart apparently or something. And she'd be like, you know, they'd say, do we have any prayer requests? And she'd be like, yes, please pray for my daughter in Harvard. Um, she has a big test coming up and I have, and then my other daughter, she's in Yale and she always like emphasized the school that they're in. You know, hypocritical. And then there was a deacon there you know, I went into the Baptist church thinking these are just like Bible-believing Christians. They live according to the scriptures. And I was so naive. <laughs> you know, boy, I had a lot to learn when I first got saved. But uh, there was a deacon there. Chuck Taft was his name. And um, and he he educated guy. And he was a Mennonite school teacher. School, school teacher at a Mennonite school, say it that way. Um, in hindsight, I think the guy was a Jesuit, but... That's another story. I mean, really, truly, I'm not just being goofy here. But, uh, and I remember he'd stand up there and he'd like do this, these like prayers. And we're like, Lord, you know, at the end they'd have him close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your beneficence and your unyielding mercies to the lowest of us wretched it was just like this like what are you reading poetry or something you know <laughs> just do these things and get all like dramatic <laughs> what is it verse five hypocrites oh we're gonna have a national prayer day let's have a prayer for peace let's pray for peace and stuff you know hypocrites what are you supposed to do Verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Um, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Kind of like... Uh, Nothing like that, of course, you know. Um, you know, blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be his most sacred heart, blessed be his most... Pr heathen, heathen practices. My Sunday missile. Heathen. And you just repeat the thing. You just do however many Hail Marys and, and then that'll get you less time in purgatory or it'll get some kind of thing, you know, whatever. Heathen. Verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Exactly as it's always read in the King James Bible. It's not been changed by the Mandela silly witchcraft effect. And it was created by witches, by the way. A witch. You can see our video on that whole Mandela effect thing. Just one of the biggest stupid deceptions out there. Verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Not to be bitter, not to hold grudges against people that have wronged you. Okay? Doesn't mean that you don't exact, you know, that there shouldn't be justice for evil people out there. Okay? You don't just let people walk all over you and just let people get away with murder. There's times that you have to stand up and say, hey, that's wrong. You better quit there. I'm going to call the police or I'm going to this or that. Okay, 
that's there. A Christian is not supposed to be a doormat. But the whole point is, when justice is served, don't keep holding the grudge against that person. Forgive and forget. But now here we get into fasting. Verse 16 through 18. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad, sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What is that reward? People's respect here on the earth. Oh, brother, he's such a godly man. Uh -huh. Verse 17, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So you should be fasting. You, you know, when you're fasting, you should not be looking like it. All right? It's between you and God. That's the first very important point of fasting in the life of a Christian. It is a personal thing between you and your Heavenly Father. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to show you that there's four different types of fasting that are given in Scripture. So that was the first one we just read there, personal between uh, you and the Lord. All right, Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Now that's kind of a, another one that we're going to discuss a little bit more as we continue here. But basically, another type of fasting that you're going to do is, I, that I would say is, you know, obviously we're not, we can't say, well, there was a time when we didn't need to fast because physically we were with Jesus. He was just right there when we first got saved. No, you know, that's not happened for anybody alive today. Um, but what we have here is there is a time when you start to fall away from the Lord and the Lord seems kind of distant from you. I mean, you'll have times of very sweet fellowship between you and the Lord and things are going great and, and it's just like you're really enjoying your salvation and you start messing around with the flesh and you kind of get away from the Lord a little bit. It's a good time to fast. See, Part of the, the idea of fasting is you're taking something very serious and saying, you know what, I need to get my relationship back with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be right back, Lord. I didn't realize it was lunchtime. No. When you really want something from the Lord, you're going to say, you know what, it, yeah, this is normally the time I eat, but you know what, I don't even want food. I want this thing settled between me and you, Lord. And you get out of fellowship with the Lord, the best thing that you can do is do a little bit of fasting, okay? I don't care about food right now, Lord. I'm sorry. I need to come back to you and I need to repent of this thing that I've been doing and whatever else. I need your help, Lord. I'm, I'm just, I'm really struggling with this thing and get it right. Don't say, well, I'll do that here in just a little bit after I'm done with supper or whatever. No, get it right. Okay. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 29 through 31. Third type of fasting here. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered, when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Twenty nine through thirty one. Okay. Just trying to see here. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't I wrote my Wrote my notes wrong here a little bit. Um, meant to say to verse 32, I'm like reading, I'm going, okay, yeah, there's, that's that good part there, but what about the fasting? Sorry about that. Verse 32, okay. Before I go to verse 32, I need to make a, a point here why I said maimed. Um, people had their arms, hand, arms cut off, hands cut off, leg cut off, whatever else. They were maimed. The maimed to be whole, verse 31. 
let's see any of these modern day fakers do that. Somebody without an arm or a leg and they come over and they touch it and it grows back. Oh, we have the power of Jesus. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can have the same powers. You couldn't have it if your life depended on it. They're fakers. See, they can pretend things. That's why I talked about my thing rebuking Chris LaSala. And I said, oh, if you're real, you got all the sign gifts and stuff. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt you. Okay? Do it. Show it to us. Prove it. And of course, they go, oh, you're tempting God and you're this and you're that. Yeah. You see, when it costs them something real, when they actually they look at one of these things in the scriptures that they can't just fake, then all of a sudden, oh, they got to get their work their way out of it. You see? I mean, you want to prove to me that some guy, guy has the power of healing that Jesus had in things like this or the disciples and whatnot? Okay. Show me somebody making someone that's maimed to be whole. Show it to me. But let's continue here with the fasting thing. But they came there, and they're watching these healings and stuff like this. Verse 32, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. Now, were these people saved? No, not in the sense we are today. Were they all believers and whatever else? Uh, ironically, if you look into the thing, you'll see a lot of these people, a lot of the crowds that were following Jesus, were also following him when he was on trial and were yelling out, crucify him. Oh, glory to God in the highest. Oh, look at this, the power of God. Come on down. He goes and he gets in trouble and the high priest is saying, turn against him. And the people go, yes, sir. Crucify him, crucify him. You say, wait a second, lost people can fast as well as saved people? Oh, sure. We'll talk about that at the end, too. Mm -hmm. But the third type of fasting that's very important is that there's something that you want to do more than eating. Don't tell me that these people were here under conviction of sin. They were there to see the show, a lot of them. And Lord still had mercy he still looked out and said, you know, I have mercy to these people and things. You know, he had compassion on the multitude. He didn't just say, you're just here to see this thing and just see people getting healed and the miracles and stuff like that. He still had compassion on them. But those people were not there to hear the gospel preached. And you'll see that there are many, many, many times where there's a huge multitude of people, you know, following Jesus around. He's healing people and stuff like this. And people are all happy with Jesus. And all of a sudden, he starts to say, he starts to open up the scriptures and he starts to preach to them and all of a sudden, uh-oh, uh, hey, look at the time. I got to get going, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're going to see another example of this as we continue here in the book of Acts, the thing of people doing something that to them is more important than eating. We're going to see another example of that coming up. But let's look at the fourth type of fasting in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 uh, verse 14 down through 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Stop right there for a minute. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Ties in with this right here, verse 20. Just thought that was interesting. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. But why doesn't it work for Christians? Because that flesh there, you know, the old mind up here, the old way of thinking, you think to yourself, I really wish that this could happen. Boy, I need this answer to prayer, but I don't think it's going to. I mean, I'd really wish that this could happen, but... 
I don't think it's going to happen. It's kind of convicting. And we all struggle with that. But let me show you something interesting here. Verse 21. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Okay? Just grab something here real quickly. I think it's probably still the same. Um, it wouldn't be in that one. Oh, here it is. Okay. The Nutty Idiots version. Matthew 17, 21. This is the new one, the 2011 one. I think it's probably still there, or, or not there, I should say. Matthew 17, yeah. They put the number in now, but you can see right there. See, there's a little 21 right there. And you go down there and it says some manuscripts include words here, words similar to Mark 5, 9, 20, or excuse me, Mark 9, 29. So they don't even, they used to put the whole verse down in the footnotes. Now they don't even do that. They just give you a little uh, thing there. You see it? Some manuscripts include, yeah. It's a Catholic Bible. But I have here a book, The NIV, The Making of a Contemporary Translation by Kenneth L. Barker. Right there, you see it? By the way, if you're hearing some weird noises outside, there's a pretty bad wind here today. And something loose on the outside of this place. So, something's rattling around out there. Um, it says here on page 56, in the NIV, Matthew 17, 21, KJV, has in parentheses there, is entirely missing. Why? To answer that question, we should first turn to Mark 9, 29. There Jesus is reported as saying to his disciples, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Again, they're quoting King James Version. Interesting that a contemporary thing is so worried about the old King James Bible. Hmm. I once heard a godly missionary say, if you don't get the answer to your prayer, then fast and God will have to answer your petition. Now, he just called him a godly missionary here. Look what he says here. But that is magic manipulating God and not, not true religion. Fasting, prayer and fasting is magic. It's manipulating God. Okay, right there you see it. The fact is that end fasting is not found in our two fourth century manuscripts. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, in other words. It apparently was added in the fifth century. Apparently. You know. <laughs> yeah. When much emphasis was being given to Gnostic asceticism and, and to monasticism, then the whole of Mark 9.29 was inserted in Matthew. But Matthew 17.21 is not found in our two earliest manuscripts, as well as in the best ninth century codex. At best, it is doubtful whether these words are genuine, and so they should not be emphasized. Yeah, well, uh, your two best, uh, your fourth century manuscripts there, Vaticanus omits whole books of the Bible, including the book of Revelation. So I guess Revelation shouldn't be in the Bible either, apparently. Stupid bunch of nonsense. But I find it interesting that a verse where Jesus is talking about a very powerful spiritual warfare tool in spiritual warfare, he's saying this devil that was in this, bull, this poor child, this poor, poor boy, um, Jesus says, you know, this kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. And the NIV goes, whoop, we'll just take that right out of there. I wonder what would be the motivation for that. Wouldn't be devils or nothing because the NIV people were solid, you know, yeah, Catholic. And and by the way, you know, I'm I'm being insulting there and things like this, but, you know, I'll show you to anybody who's new to this issue. Let me just show you something here quick. Here you have the NIV story. Yeah, that's a new version book. I won't hurt it. Um, the NIV story by Burton Goddard. Right there. And he says, you're saying, oh, you're crazy. You know, you, you can't prove that it was done by a Catholic... Uh, um, you know, these guys aren't Catholics, they're Protestants. Okay, well, here you have page 96, and it says, 
Um, you know, the, an order of Catholic nuns operates the residence and affectionate ties of Christian love soon bind the hearts of all together in a marvelous way. Over here it talks about an ecumenical experience. So it's talking about where the, some of the translation work was being done at. Right there you can read it for yourself. Over here, I'll do it that way because I can't see it too good, but trying to hold it still. Okay. So, dropping little bookmarks out of it like crazy. But yeah, the NIV was partly translated at a Catholic university, the University of Salamanca. And uh, it just turns out that that university is the one where one of the, I, should say, I don't know if it's one of the ones or the one where uh, Ignatius Loyola, I like to say Ignatius, it gets Catholics worked up. But uh, Ignatius Loyola, um, you know, he was educated there. So, the University of Salamanca. Kind of an interesting thing that the NIV would be partly produced at the same university that trained the founder of the Jesuit order. Documented, look it up. Now, what are the four types of fasting that we've gone over already? Okay, first of all, you have for personal needs, and it's also in the in the same thing there. It's uh, the sacrifice of giving alms and praying and also uh, fasting. It's all there. Three different types of spiritual sacrifices that you can do. So you have personal needs. That's the first type of fasting that you can do as a Christian. Number two, you have when the Lord seems distant. When you've kind of fallen out of fellowship with the Lord, it might be a good idea to do some fasting to get back in fellowship and show Him that you're serious about that relationship that you have. Uh, Number three is when you can fast when something is more important than food. And for a Christian, of course, that's going to be, you know, you have some kind of a thing that you really want, a prayer that you really want answered or something else. Um, it's more important to you than even eating. And fourthly, you have for spiritual warfare. Uh, there is that. But now, uh, is fasting for a Christian? I mean, is this just something that was around there in the gospel accounts, but not for today as Christians? Well, let's look about that. Acts chapter 10. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 30 through 33. Okay, it says here, And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call here Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Okay, was Cornelius saved? No. He was a lost man at that point in time, but he was trying to get God's attention, essentially. And what did he do? Fasted, prayed, and he gave alms. What Jesus said about it in Matthew chapter 6. Rather interesting there. And I've Talked about this in other studies, but you get a lot of people out there today that call themselves Christians and they say, there's no prayer that will save you. Prayer is a work and blah, blah, blah. Uh, right there. Verse 31. Cornelius, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. God heard the prayers of a lost man that wanted to know about salvation. And you keep reading there, Cornelius gets saved. Hmm. Interesting. But there you have... A, an example of a man that is basically following the advice of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6. You know, and it leads to his salvation. So definitely a personal need. So that would be type number one of fasting. The personal need thing of, of you know, spiritual sacrifices that you're doing. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 verse... What we have here, 21 through 23. 
And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's trouble there. You know, again, that's why the posties will come up with this thing of calling the time of Jacob's trouble, they'll call it the great tribulation, because then they can use verses like this to try to say, see, we're going to have to go through much tribulation, so we go through the great tribulation. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, I mean, they will. It's true for them. I'm beginning to realize that more and more. I've been saying that, but, you know, it's it's finally getting through the thick skull up here. I'm like, why can't these people see? It's like, because they're lost. <laughs> and they are going into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why they're sticking to it so strong, because it's true for them. Verse 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended uh, them to the Lord on whom they believed. All right, so what type of uh, fasting, prayer and fasting, do we have here? Is it for personal needs? Well, not really. Um, is it, uh, you know, when the Lord seemed distant from them? and they, No. Um, was it they had something else to do that was more important, so they fasted? No. I believe it was spiritual warfare. That was the reason that they were praying and fasting. Uh, they needed faithful men to go out there and confirm those disciples. All right? And it doesn't mean just the 12 disciples in this passage here. It's talking about people that are being discipled, new converts and things like that, confirming the churches. And, uh, you know, that's been something that's been a real um, kind of a weird thing for me because I come out and I'm very strongly advocating that Christians get out of the whole church building system because it's, it's not scriptural. Uh, and there's a whole lot of problems on the church building thing. I've talked about them for years, so I'm not going to get into it here. But a big part of what was being done there in the early part of you know, the church age is you had them going out confirming churches, confirming disciples. Um, you know, somebody says, I'm a Christian and things like this. Well, okay, we're going to send somebody over later and, and see how you're doing. They confirm them. You know, they were looking for changed lives. But now you can just make professions of faith and, and everybody's supposed to believe that you're a Christian. Uh, it's not how it worked in the first century there. But they had an extreme need to have good, faithful Christians. And so part of the confirming them was praying and fasting. You know, and I would say, you know, a modern day application, I would say if, uh, you know, um, if you're single and you're thinking about getting married or something like that and, and somebody, you know, is you're interested in and they're interested in you and, and you're thinking, is this the right one or whatever? You might want to do some praying and fasting. Um, if you have a small home fellowship or whatever and uh, you have somebody that wants to come and join that, do some praying and fasting. I mean, there's different things like that uh, that you shouldn't just... The Bible talks about laying hands suddenly on no man. And not being partakers of other men, <coughs> excuse me, other men's sins. Praying and fasting is very important for that. <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it's something caught in my throat there. Acts chapter twenty-seven. <clears throat> Acts twenty-seven, verse twenty-seven through thirty-six. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. This is Paul, he's on the boat being taken to his uh, appearance before Caesar. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under collar as, they, uh, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting having taken nothing, taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, and for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. 
And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. Paul told lost people that they were fasting. And they certainly were. Fourteen days without eating anything? Why? Well, they were trying to keep the ship going. They were trying not to just be, you know, have a shipwreck out at sea and drown. You know, it was a very, very important thing. You're not going to be like, you know, bailing water and trying to steer the thing, get it away from the rocks and everything else. Oh, lunchtime. You know, they ding the dinner bell or something like that. No. <laughs> um, there are some times that you're going to run into as a Christian uh, where you're just going to have work to do or, or some kind of things to do, and you can use that time to fast. Um, and in that time, the Bible says we're to be praying without ceasing. So in that time where you're doing that work, uh, you can be praying in that time as as long or along with doing that work. Uh, the other day, uh, we were down in our property, and I'm building as much as I can right now down there. Um, we're if it's sunny, we're down there. If it's rainy, we're here. You know, and and uh, a lot of times, sometimes we don't have a choice. We have to be here or whatever. Um, we have worked in the rain a couple times, so it doesn't always work out. But point is, uh, we're working very hard down there building things. And the other day we were down there, and uh, for 12 hours uh, I was working. I didn't have a thing to eat as far as any kind of meal or whatever. I think we had some mixed nuts or something like that. I had some of them and a little bit of drink of water or two. And that was it for 12 hours, working hard, hard, very, very hard physically. And you'll, you'll notice when you do that that you'll go through kind of this period of like extreme hunger and you get kind of weak and kind of lightheaded, and then it's like you kind of, get past that and all of a sudden the hunger starts to kind of go away and there's a whole lot of health stuff that goes on with fasting I'll talk about that at the end um, fasting is actually extremely good for you but in that time um, you know I'm praying the whole time and just saying Lord you know I need to get this thing done and uh, you know please give me wisdom about this Lord and oh, thank you Lord that that's a good idea and I can build it this way and I can do that and I can how am I going to do this thing? And then the Lord puts an idea in my mind and, and you know, giving God the glory for the whole thing. And uh, it's it turns out to be a pretty good time and you get a lot of things done. Um, you know, I'm not going to make a regular habit of that, you know, in terms of that because I was getting pretty weak towards the end. But my point is that third type of fasting there where you have something that's very important for you to get this thing accomplished, you might skip some meals. But in the midst of that, use that time to pray. You see, it isn't that, you know, well, I'm, I'm working at my job here or I'm, <clears throat> I'm doing this housework or we're moving things and whatever else. I don't have time for a meal. So, I mean, Paul calls it fasting, what the, you know, soldiers were doing there. He calls it fasting. You spend 14 days fasting. He calls it fasting. And it, you know, technically it is fasting. And it's not that you say, well, I'm going without food, so it doesn't count for actual spiritual type of thing. Oh, no. As a Christian, you're supposed to be, like I said, you're supposed to be praying all the time. Pray without ceasing. And so in the midst of that time when you're working really hard like that, be seeking the Lord's will for whatever you're doing, but also use that time as you're, as you're doing some things. You, don't, you, know, you can be saying, Lord, I, I just remembered uh, brother so-and-so. He's struggling with his job right now. And, you know, I, could you please just help him with that thing? And, Oh, sister so-and-so, she's got some sickness she's dealing with. Could you please, you know, praying while fasting. Different types of fasting. <clears throat> I'll show you another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 3 through 5. I'm talking about the marriage relationship here. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not the one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So, yes, it is a powerful form of spiritual warfare, but... In marriage, it can become a problem. 
Because if you go too far with praying and fasting and things like that, and you don't come together again for the marriage bed, um, you're going to you know, run the risk of the devil starting to mess with you. You know, that is a part of the, the thing of, of marriage, part of the responsibility there between a husband and a wife. So what would that type be? That'd be type number four, the fourth type of prayer for spiritual warfare. You know, and I guess you could technically say, you know, personal needs as well, um, that a husband and wife could both have some personal needs, some things that they're going through and whatever, and, and just kind of want to, let's just kind of abstain, you know, I'm going to take some time and, and, uh, Talk to the Lord about this thing. Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses four through ten. <clears throat> I like to go over these. This list here uh, is a good reminder um, what we should be like as Christians. Uh, the things that we should look for in our lives. Compare yourself to this list, and another one we'll be reading here in just a minute. But uh, verse four. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. There you see it. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. You know, you're going through some rough times and stuff, go down through that and say, you know, there's a lot of people attacking me right now. Well, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. You know, well, I'm going through some depression, brother. I'm going through some hard stuff, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It's an important thing there. But you see it there, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Now, what would that type of fasting be? Which of the four types? Well, I would say probably all four, actually. The, you know, you're going to have just approving yourself as a minister of Jesus Christ, you're going to have times of, I have personal needs here, and I'm, I'm going to have to make some sacrifices to get this thing answered. All right? That's an important thing. Um, you know, as a minister of Jesus Christ, you're going to fall sometimes. You're going to mess up. You're going to get a little bit distant from the Lord, and you're going to say, you know what? I need to have that relationship restored again. And you're going to pray. Spend some time in prayer, including missing meals. So you get that relationship restored. Number three, you're going to have some times where you're going to be working, doing something. doesn't even have to be for the Lord, but you're just doing something and food just is not as important as getting that thing done. And in that time, you're thinking about the Lord and you're praying and you're talking to the Lord and things like that. Are you going to have that as a minister of Jesus Christ? Sure, absolutely. And of course, number four, spiritual warfare. Uh, yeah, definitely. You will have that uh, as part of the approval of being a minister of Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Final place we're going to turn to today. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. And you're going to see the four different types here again, because we're talking again about approving yourself as the minister of, as a minister of Christ. Verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in in uh, perils in the sea, excuse me, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, some of the worst, actually, in weariness and painfulness, in f watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. So it isn't just, you know, oh, I'm hungry, so that's fasting. No, it's two different things, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, 
besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul's dealing with other Christians. Doesn't mean Paul was a janitor and taking care of church buildings or going around and putting new siding on them or something. You know, with the buildings. No, I don't think so. He was concerned about Christians. <clears throat> so, there you have, again, you're going to have all four of the different types of fasting in that. Now, what are the types of fasting that you can do? I'll give you a little bit of advice on that. Um, it does Again, it doesn't have to be a, you know, this thing of like, okay, I'm going to start fasting at 7 o'clock a.m. the morning of, you know, and I'm going to do it for exactly how, you know, many days or whatever else. It doesn't have to be that. And, of course, you know, you have the Lord out in the wilderness, you know, 40 days he fasted. So just wanted to add that in there. Uh, there's a lot more we could talk about on the subject of fasting, but... Um, just wanted to give you those scriptures, but how do you fast? What is the what is the whole point there? Well, um, it's really actually a lot easier than most people think. People get into the thing of, um, well, can you have, can you drink water when you're fasting? Well, you have to stay hydrated. Yeah, that's pretty important. Um, there might be a time when you're, <clears throat> you know, uh, someplace where you don't have something to drink, and you might go for most of the day, uh, you know working on something, you know, type number three of fasting, and you just, you know, Lord, please take care of me and things, and Lord will, you know, take care of you and whatever. Again, it doesn't have to be some prescribed way. There's no, there's no, like, this is the formula for fasting and nothing else works. No, no, there's different types of fasting, um, you know, and, you know, if there's some kind of a thing where, um, you need some prayer answered, you know, something that you're really struggling with, some spiritual warfare issue or whatever. Uh, you know, I'd say just start praying, you know, and stay down and keep praying until you get a, a clear, definite answer one way or the other on that thing. You know, the old timers, they talked about praying through. Um, you know, there were times, the old, some of the old uh, revival meetings and stuff, I've read stories. I mean, there'd be people there down at the, the altar and things. I realize there's issues, but, you know, They'd be down there praying sometimes all night and into the next day. They weren't taking lunch break through that thing. Okay, Again, it's, it's the idea is not, um, I would like to do an official fast. It's just, I want this answer to prayer, and I'm going to get down here on my knees, and I'm going to start praying, or I'm going to do this thing, or I'm going to do that. And a lot of times, you, don't, you, you know, you're like, I'm really hungry. Whatever, I need to get this thing answered. I need to pray. I need to. I need to have an answer to this prayer, and you don't even think about food. You know, um, there might be some kind of another thing in your life that you need to get done. Uh, you're going to send out a bunch of gospel tracts or, or whatever. You're going to go out and spend the day tracting or something like that, and and you're out spending the day tracting, and it's just like I just you, things are really going good for you, and and you just say, I don't. You know, I'm kind of hungry, but whatever. What are you doing? You're fasting. You see. Um, so, uh, I hope that answers that question. Um, it's not that, you know, you're disqualified. You didn't fast because you uh, drank some water or something like that. Or it can, can you have a soup fast you know, or a, a, a solid food fast, but you can eat soup or something? All this little stuff. It's not about that. It's about, you know, you giving up the thing whatever it is, whatever level there, and just simply saying, Lord, I really need to answer to prayer. You know, fasting is tied in with prayer. That's what it's going to be like there. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this simply because I'm going to, if you really are curious about it, you can do your own study on it. But it's kind of funny. Um, there's this whole new craze now, this health craze, intermittent fasting. I know there's a Dr. Mike Vander Sheldon, uh, I've seen some of his videos. He seems to be, you know, pretty good as far as health, you know, stuff is concerned. Always take that with a grain of salt, of course. You're going to have some new agey stuff entering into these chiropractic natural health practitioner guys. Um, I don't think he's a saved man or anything. You know, he says he's a Christian, but I think he probably means Catholic. But he'll, you know, he'll let some profanity fly. But um, good information. I mean, he has some real good stuff on superfoods and whatever. Um, He's tied in with uh, Dr. John Bergman out there in California. Um, both men are very intelligent men. 
but uh, Van der Sheldon wrote a book about intermittent fasting, and he gets into a lot of the health benefits of this thing. And um, I know Dr. Josh Axe has some stuff, and Eric Berg, Dr. Eric Berg has some things. Um, you know, I mean, when you when you go through years and years and years of bad health, let me just say this, uh, and you start to get into the alternative health world and the nutritional therapy and things, and you feel the difference that it makes. I think you're going to understand why I'm talking about these guys. Okay, they, it is it is a good thing as a Christian to eat well and things. Don't go overboard with the whole thing of your nutrition, your your body's health. Don't go too nuts into that, where that's all you're doing and you're forsaking reading the Bible. Um, you know, bodily exercise profiteth little. All right, uh, certainly, but it is important for you to keep yourself in good physical shape. Uh, again, I've done ministry sometimes in my past where I just let my health go, and at first, you know, it's okay. You're doing studies and things, and but you know, it starts to to catch up to you. Bad health. But um, this internet intermittent internet fasting, that's a good idea too. Actually, fasting from the internet, <laughs> abstain from the internet. Uh, good for your health. Intermittent fasting. Okay, I'm going to give you five things that it does. Okay, number one, it promotes human growth hormone (HGH). Human growth hormone is a thing. It's just basically makes you very healthy. It's kind of an anti-aging thing. Um, it's you know, I, I, I again, I'm you know, you can look into this thing. I'm not going to. I can't do a huge big thing on it. I'm not an expert by any means, but it, it's basically the thing of your ability, your body's ability to repair itself, and and you know things. Um, like that and I mean when you what this intermittent fasting thing is basically you eat like around noon around lunch or so then you go to about six o'clock in the evening and then at six o'clock you eat a good meal and then you don't eat anything again till noon the next day and when you wake up they're not using it as time to pray or whatever but when they wake up then you do some work you work until noon and when you are working in that fasting thing and a lot of them put it into a ketogenic diet thing where you're again you can look in, into that whole thing um animal fats and stuff like that um which is you know good in my opinion but i go off on a big tangent here but when you are working out in that fasting state um it'll kick in all kinds of things and this human growth hormone will you know can go up you know, hundreds of percents, you know, some even say like a thousand percent, and it's going to help your body rejuvenate, it's going to um, bring down stress levels, it's going to help with brain function, all kinds of different things. Um, we've been doing this thing for many years now, my wife and I, uh, we eat two meals a day, and that's it. Uh, we've been doing that for a very long time, and it is definitely, it works. At first, it was like really rough for me, because I was raised on three meals a day, and I always kind of thought the two meal a day thing sounded like a good idea, but but uh, boy, when we started to do two meals a day, it was really a a great thing after my body got used to it. But number two, intermittent fasting will uh, help you balance your insulin levels. Um, that's another big positive benefit to the whole thing. Uh, number three, it'll regulate hormones. Different hormones will be regulated better with intermittent fasting. Number four, lowers triglycerides. Uh, again, getting into a whole big thing there um, with your fats and things like that. It's doing all kinds of stuff there. Like I said, I can't get into a whole lot of this, but number five, it detoxifies the body. Um, fasting is a great way to detoxify the body from heavy metals that are in the air, heavy metals in food that you're eating. Um, it's going to be a good thing to do fasting. I just I find it funny that, you know, these modern health crazes and we just discovered that that fasting is actually really good for your health like uh, yeah that's probably why the bible said to do it you know thousands of years ago so and it's in the old testament too by the way i didn't get into that but uh it's been a practice of jews and christians for thousands of years so you know modern science modern medical science catches up once in a while you know but uh uh, should a Christian fast? Absolutely. Um, should secular people fast? Absolutely. Fasting is good for your body. It's good for your health. Uh, for a Christian, it's good not only for your physical health, it's also good for your spiritual health. 
Um, if you have something that you really need answered prayer on, um, it's not magic or manipulation like the stupid NIV guy said um, to fast. The Lord tells you to do it. All right. Now, if you're saying, you know, I want a million dollars or something like this, and it's it's a your own lust that you want uh, some thing that you're coveting for, or whatever, uh, you know, fasting and stuff like that. Yeah, I would say that that's trying to manipulate God. But if you have some kind of a, a whatever, some kind of a serious thing that's that would be in line with the Lord's will for your life to have that thing answered, and you want to fast about that, pray and fast. Absolutely, do it. Uh, very important. So um, there's, I would say, the biggest things you need to take away from this study. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to fast in terms of, uh, you know, this prescribed methods of you can have orange juice or apple juice, but you can't drink lemonade, or you can have some water, but you can't have soup, or it just something comes into your mind. You say, I really need this thing answered, Lord. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to, I, you know, and you don't even think about eating. You know, that's going to be the main type of fasting. So, I um, hope that answers your question. And uh, I guess we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.